Now, let's get in on where we're kind of going today. Where are my, my Dateline 48 Hours fans in the room? Let me see you, all right? You got, do you like watching those shows? I love watching those shows. Me and Callie love watching those shows. We'll get in the bed, time to go to bed. We'll turn on an episode of Dateline. And uh, like, I immediately, I'm all in. Like, I can't go to bed until I have closure. Like, I need, like, tell me what happened. I just, it's just hanging in the balance the whole time. If you know anything about those shows, how they work is crime is committed, and the 911 call comes in. Uh, the police show up, and they begin an investigation uh, of what happens. They're kind of gathering some information, some testing, some witness. a suspect, an alleged suspect. They begin to gather uh, evidence against that suspect. They're gathering testing through uh, forensic, DNA, uh, gun residue tests, crime lab tests. They're gathering up all of this evidence. Uh, and then they ultimately come to the very end. And when they think they have a good case, they go to court. And the question that is left us hanging in the balance of the final episode is, do they have enough evidence to convict? Are they going to have enough evidence to convict? In the book of 1 John, what John is doing is he's presenting a lot of evidence on what a genuine follower of Christ looks like. I want to ask you a question this morning before we get started. If Christianity was a crime and someone accused you of being a Christian, would they have enough evidence to convict you? If someone said, are you a Christian, and they're accusing you, which would be a glorious accusation, would they have enough evidence to convict you? If your response to that question is the stereotypical Bible Belt answer, well, yes, I grew up in the church. Uh, in fact, I, I think I was born in the first pew. Uh, that's where my mom had me. I'm there. I've always been there. Uh, I can remember when I invited Jesus into my heart at VBS or camp. I mean, I got sprinkled. I, I went through confirmation. I got baptized. I'm a good person. Of course, I'm a Christian. Listen, if that is your defense against a Christian accusation, you need to fire your inner lawyer. Because if that's your answer, you're either grossly confused about what the gospel is or you may not know God at all. It's a spiritual suicide answer. According to Matthew 7, there's going to be a lot of people that answer like that, right? They stand before God and Matthew 7 is a story and they get up and, and they're standing before the divine judge in the heavenly courts and he says, what's your case? What evidence do you have? And the people that answer just like I just answered, he will look at them and say, depart from me. I never knew you. Your ticket is counterfeit. Your ticket is counterfeit. Now, the number one, the only evidence of a Christian, the only way someone becomes a Christian true, genuine Christian, a born-again believer, and is in right standing with God is because they have trusted in Jesus Christ alone. They've been saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. It's the only reason. Like, if you stand before God and you answer that question, that's the only acceptable answer to God. Because of Jesus, he says, enter these gates with thanksgiving and praise. Right? That's, what, that's, what, that's the only way we get in, right? But 1 John takes us through a lot of other tests, evidences of, that actually prove and verify if our faith is actually real. That's what this whole letter is about. And we've, we've gone through a lot of little mini tests. If you've been with us in the series, you've heard them. If you're not, go back online. You can watch this whole letter go through. But John's been taking us through a lot of tests, the doctrinal tests, the moral tests, the behavioral tests, love tests. He's taking us through a lot of tests. And these are very, very important tests. They're way more important than your driver's license test that you'll take, right? Uh, your ACT, more important, more important than every other kind of test, including your COVID test. These results actually matter from eternal perspective, right? You don't just kick out, get kicked out of school. You do not get to inherit God today, and you will never experience who God is. So it's, 
It's a huge, huge test. Today, John will continue the test. He is known as the apostle of love, a.k.a. he's the love doctor, all right? And today, what he's going to do is he's going to take us through the love test. The love test. Sounds a bit like one of those infomercials at 3 a.m. on your cable, right? It's a little weird, right? But this love test today is not about romance. It's not sexual. It is about assurance, and it is supernatural. The question that John will leave us with today is this. If you love church people, like this whole thing is about if you love the brother or the sisters, if you love those in the household of faith, the church folk, if you do, then it proves and is evidence that you are in fact born of God. But if you do not love the brothers and the sisters and you just kind of go to church with them, that in fact that you are not born of God. This is a very black and white test he's going to give today. This is the love test. Now, some of you, we start talking about love in the church and loving one another. You might be sitting there right now and thinking, gee, my spouse really needs to hear this one, right? <laughs> or you're thinking, uh, this person next to me really is going to benefit from this sermon. Or your mind is like, gosh, I wish so-and-so was here. They really need to hear this one, right? I'm going to share this thing later. They really need to be lovers. I want to caution you against doing that. Uh, because I don't know of anyone who's ever got a degree in Love University, that me included. We have to learn this over and over and over again, all right? Now, if you're also here, you might also be thinking, uh, we've heard this before from John. We've heard this love one another thing already in chapter 2 and in verse, and chapter 3. Yes, we have heard this before, love one another. So why is it that we get this repetitive idea once again. You might be saying, God, I want to hear this again. Well, the reason that we need to hear this again is because if you're like me, I never make a mistake once or twice. I'm sorry, I never make it twice. I make it the third time, the fourth time. I just keep going and going and going and going. I just don't learn the lesson about love. So John knows that about us. He knows that we're people who need repetition. And that's why he's going to lay this out for us in the most extensive love sermon from John here today. In verse 7 through 21, let me read it in its entirety, and then we will go back and unpack it. Here we go. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him. And he and God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God. And God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us. So that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is also are we in this world. There is no fear in love. But perfect love Cast out fear, for the fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. 
30 times in 7 through 21, the word love is professed. It's 30 times in some form, beloved, love, love one another, love. 30 times, clearly love is the theme of this passage. As I told you, love was John's thing, all right? So we could talk about a lot of things, probably four or five sermons in this, but today what I'm going to do is break this down into three simple points um, and clarify, and hopefully we can, we can understand John's main, the main thing kind of deal here out of this passage. All right, so here we go. Uh, this, this word love, first of all, is agape love. All right, so this is a self-giving, self-sacrificing, unconditional kind of love that John is using here. Uh, the first word, the first idea here is that God, God that a child can get it, and yet it baffles the mature Christian. I mean, they're probably teaching the idea of God is love down in preschool and kids' ministry. It's not a deep doctrinal issue there, but it seems as shallow as as the shore, but it's as deep as the ocean. They understand that that God is love. We do not fully understand and comprehend what that actually means. it's, it's It's a much more complex idea than we think. So why is John out of the gate saying God is love? Well, remember the false teachers that John was facing in the church, the Gnostics and the Docetics. Uh, They taught, remember, that that God was not a personal God, that he never actually came in the flesh. So therefore, if he never came in the flesh, he's not a personal God. Therefore, he does not love. And John is saying here, no, 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 no. The Christian God is love, very much love. Love. Now, every other world religion that we even face today, none of their gods mean love. John is saying the Christian God is love. It's who he is. Uh, It's what it means to be God. God is love. He is the origin of love. He is the inventor of love. Love wasn't this idea that man came up with. God is the origin, the inventor of love. It's in his nature. God is not just loving. God is love. In the same way that light comes from the sun and heat comes from fire, love comes from God because God is love. All right? Now, the idea of God is love is often uh, misconstrued. People get spiritual dyslexia and they get these words out of order and they twist them to make them say or think what they want them to think. And here's what I mean by that. Number one, God is love does not mean love is God. Now, what I mean by that is, you know, people They worship love as their God. And here's what their mantra, their anthem is love wins. All right, you see that around places? Love just wins. Love just trumps all things, including God. And what the world just needs is love. These people are called loveites, all right? And if you were uh, back around in the 60s, you might remember this. In 1967, uh, the Beatles got together a live satellite concert in uh, 26 countries, 400 million people gathered together when the world was hostile, there was no peace, and they sang a song, All We Need Is Love. It sounds great, right? Beatles, awesome. What a unifying song. I mean, this has to be good. Good intentions, but impotent in power. You see, what the world did not need then and world does not need now is love. It doesn't need love. It needs to be connected to the God who is love. Does that make sense? We don't don't run around and say, can't we just love each other? How can people love each other if they're not connected to the God who is love? Let us be careful about turning, uh, about becoming Levites and thinking that just love wins the day because love is not a God. 
We don't want people to bow down to the altar of love. We want them to bow down to the altar of Christ, who is love. That's, that's evangelism, right? So show them Christ. Then and then only can we begin to love like Christ calls us to love. All right. Now, the other danger in thinking that love is a God or love is a worship, something that I worship, is if that happens, then what happens is you will worship what you love. And we see this all the time. We see people loving and worshiping what they love. I love, so therefore I worship my job, my career, my car, uh, my job, my kids, their sports. This is what happens when you turn love into a God. You begin to worship things that you love. And John is saying, no, 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 it's not love is a God, it's God is love. Now the other error, the other thing we need to be cautious against is when we say God is love, it does not mean that God is only love. I think all of us have a tendency to elevate an attribute of God over the other. You know what I mean? Like God is so many things. There's so many attributes. I can't even list them today. But I think we all have this uh, propensity to elevate one over the other. And there is such a great danger in only saying God is love. If you say that God is love and that's all that he is, you're denying every single other attribute he has. And it's so dangerous because it's like coming to a four-way stop and only looking one way. God is love. Yes, he is. God is also spirit. God is light. God is also a consuming fire. And we cannot pick and choose the attributes of God that we love that most resonate with us and feel good. Because if we do that, if all God is is love, then we'll just love the sinner and we'll just keep loving the sinner. We'll confirm their sin and just hopefully I'll just, I'll just love the sin out of people. No, 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 no. Love does love the sinner, but love does not serve sin. There's a big difference there. It is unloving, in fact, many ways to not tell people that truth. God is love, yes, but God is also holy. He is also just. He's also wrath. He's a lot of things that we don't have time to unpack today, but we cannot deny the other attributes of God. Now, the second point I want to make today is this. God, who is love, now God loves us. All right, so if he is love, he's the origin of love, the source of love. Now he loves us. But before I just jump right in and tell you that God loves you, I want to, I want to share with you something that I think John does here to really correct our theology. And he does this in verse 10 and verse 19. Okay? And in verse 10 and 19, John repeats two simple truths. It is not that we've loved God, but that God has loved us first. Why is it that John is going out of the way here twice to repeat this idea that we did not love God, he loved us first? Here's what I think he's trying to teach us here, that we are not the origin of love. It never came from us to begin with. Have you ever heard someone's testimony? And their testimony was this. I've always loved God. I mean, I grew up in church. I've, all, I've just always been there with God. I've always known God. I've always known he's there. I always believe him. And I, I've just always loved God. And I always just love people. John is saying to you, no no, no. You, in fact, were a lover of self, not a lover of God. In fact, Paul would agree with John. Look what Paul says in Romans 1.30. Of all of us in our born nature, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, Inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Ouch. See, if, if you and, and I are honest with ourselves, and we actually look at our heart, 
in the mirror of God's word, we would see we were not born lovers of God. Haters of God. You have to understand this because if you think that you've just always loved God, you don't need the cross. His death was unnecessary for you because you've just always loved God. But for those who understand that Paul is talking about them, a slander, a hater of God, now, now you understand that you need God's love. Amen to that. Let's, now I need something. Now that you've broken me down and you've showed me who I am, now I'm thirsty for God's love. And I need it, and I need it in a bad, bad way, and so do you. So now... God loves us and he manifests it. He does something about it. And here's how he does it in verse nine. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he have loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So this was, wasn't just that God just had this universal love of all people. It wasn't just he looked down and said, I just love everybody. No, no, no. He, he's saying that love was demonstrated, that love was manifested in the person of Christ. God, God's love is not just hidden in the heart. It was made manifest, evidence, seen for all people to clearly see his love through sending of a son to pursue a cross to die for what? The propitiation for our sins. Now, if you were here uh, a few weeks ago, we talked about this word propitiation, but let me, let me explain it like this. Your sin, the, the sin that you inherited, all the things that Paul just said here, all the sin in us that are very true about us, it angered God and his wrath kindled against me because of my sin and I deserve it and I deserve the penalty but in God's love for me he did something about although I was a hater of God he sent his one and only son in fact he killed his one and only son to satisfy his own wrath to satisfy to be a propitiation For my sin. Jesus Christ was wrath bearer and wrath remover. This is what John Calvin said, the principal evidence of what love is, the cross. Now let me me see if I can personalize this for just a moment. I think when we hear about this idea of God's love and sending the cross and die for everyone who believes, and that, I think we lack personalization to that sometimes. What I want you to image in your mind just for a moment, if you've seen any version of Christ and his road to Calvary, picture in just your mind for just a moment every single step that Jesus Christ took from Calvary to the cross meant I love you. And I mean your name. If you are in Christ Jesus, his, your name was on his mind as he took every single step. Every lash from the cat of nine tails that ripped his flesh out, every drop of blood that he bled, every nail that went into his body was him saying, I love you, I love you, I love you. That is how deep the Father's love is for you. And if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the God who is love loves you forever and ever. And as Matt said earlier, nothing will separate you from the love of Christ Jesus. But if you do not follow Jesus, you are saying no to God's love. Don't say no to God's love. Say yes to Jesus. Because in the cross, 
we see how great the Father's love is for us. We're going to do something a little bit different today. I'm going to step away. Brad is going to sing a sermon over you for just a moment and remind you of how deep the Father's love is. You may sit, let him sing over you, and just marinate in these gospel truths. Uh, thank you, Brad, for, for doing that for us. I think about when I, I hear that song and I think about um, what held Jesus on the cross. Like we didn't know at any moment he could have 
you know, called down a thousand angels and uh, destroyed Rome and everyone who was trying to kill him. He could have done that at any moment. We think also, maybe it was the nails that kept him on the cross. What these gospel truths mean, what held him on the cross and secured him was the love of God. <laughs> That's what kept him on the cross because he so greatly loved And that is how deep the Father's love is for us. Now, the sermon, if all we say is, God loves me, no matter what I do, God just loves me no matter what. If that's all that we do and it terminates upon us, then we do not understand the passage. If all we say is, God loves me, and I can do whatever I want to, I can fall into antinomianism, I can get drunk on grace, I have a license to sin, I can do, if that's what happens, then you don't understand the first part. This love of God towards us is now supposed to produce, it's supposed to make me and you tools of love in the hands of God to love other people. And this is our third point. We should love each other. Now, as I said, this is the, verse 7 and 21 are the bookends of this entire passage. So clearly, love one another is the call here. I want to show you something in verse 11, though, that's very uh, interesting, at least I thought it was. In verse 11, where he says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. What does John mean by the word ought here? What does he have in mind by the word ought? Ought here. I think our first thought is maybe it's imitation. So if Christ did this, let us imitate Christ and be like Christ. I don't think that mere imitation is what John had in mind here when he says we ought to love one another. What I think John is explaining here because of the surrounding passages, I think what John is saying, it should be in our nature, our new nature. I'll explain it like this. One of the favorite things that I love to do as a pastor is I love to go uh, hold these newborn babies. When they're born, like it's my favorite thing to do. I mean, I just sit there, I hold these babies and I've been doing a lot of that lately. And you sit there and it's, it's, it's the goodness of God in my hands and I get to pray over this baby and the parents and we read in Psalm 127 together and I just love it. And what happens is, and this is probably not to your surprise, when I sit down and I look at these babies they look strikingly familiar to their parents, right? I mean, they look like mom and dad in some ways. Well, that shouldn't come to a surprise to me. Why? Because that's where they came from, right? They ought to look like their parents. That is the idea here when John says we ought to love one another because if we have been born of God, it is in our new nature to love like our daddy loves. God is in us. God's seed is in us. And when we love one another, we are in a way uh, showing to the world that we are a chip off the old block. Hey, that's my daddy. My daddy did this, so I'm going to be and look and love like my daddy loves. That is what he's communicating here. The new birth produces a new nature and it's just to love. We ought to. It's in our nature to do so. In the same way that a fish should fly, and, a, and, a, and a, I'm, I'm, no, I said fish should fly. Goodness gracious, what am I talking about? A fish should swim. Third service, give me some grace here. In the same way that a bird ought to fly. It is in our new nature, and we ought to love because we have the very nature and imprint of God, our Father, inside of us. That is what John means by this. It, in fact, there's really no way that we can't love. That's the point here. There's no way we can't love because it's in our nature to do so. So how do we love others? How do we go practically do this? Well, now we do look at Jesus for imitation because he gave us a roadmap on how to do that. 
It's in our nature, but we do imitate. How do we imitate the love of Jesus? How did Jesus demonstrate his love? Well, clearly he did it in two ways. He lived, uh, he denied himself and he died to himself. Those are two clear things that mark the life of Jesus Christ, right? His whole life, his existence on the earth was denying himself, denying himself, denying himself, putting other people before himself. And then ultimately it ended with him dying to himself and what he truly wanted for the good of other people. We know that in Luke 9, 23, when Jesus says, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself. So the way to love other people is denial of self and death to self. And why that's so difficult? Because number one, it's in your nature to not do that. In our nature, remember, we are lovers of self. So you're gonna fight that. You're not naturally a lover of others. You you love yourself. And the other reason that's a challenge is because we live in a culture that is about promoting yourself. Love yourself. Protect yourself. Take pictures of yourself for the glory of yourself. That's the culture that we live in. But Jesus is saying, not if you want to follow me. The way to me, the pathway to heaven is selflessness. And I read a quote one time, don't remember the author, but I do want to read it. It says, the less you think of yourself, the more people will think of you. But the more you think of yourself, the less people will think of you. And that is so true. I mean, that is the straight truth. That if we truly want to be thought of well, we'll think less of ourselves, and we'll put other people in front of us. What are some practical ways that we do that? All right. Uh, I think one would be, there's some emotive things. There's some in, internal things that happen. I think we, uh, we begin with love is humility. Love rejoices in the good of others. So when we see someone a brother or sister in Christ doing good, growing in their faith. Whatever the case is, we rejoice in their good. We do not get jealous. We don't, we, don't, we don't want harm for them. We want good for those. That's one marker of those. I think another one, a way that love is, love is encouraging a spouse instead of criticizing them. It's always going to be more easy to criticize than it is to encourage. Why? Because discouragement and criticism is the native tongue. So every single word of encouragement is an act of war against our old nature. It's an expression of love. Um, Now, it's not just internal. Once again, I think another way that we show uh, that we love is we tell other people in the church that we love them. We tell people that you love them here. We say that to our earthly families, don't we? We have no problem doing that. I love you, love you, love you. But when it comes to the church, who is supposed to be, according to Scripture, the more eternally significant family, the family of God, do you look at your brothers and sisters and say, I love you? It's a great application. Begin to do that today. But it is not just a feeling. It's not just words. It's also physical and it's very active in the same way that God's love for us was not just emotional it became manifested in a physical act across the demonstration of God's love so us we have to display this love we can't just say I love you and I have a warm fuzzy feeling I have to show it we have to show this love towards one another what's one of the ways that we do that well we do what Christ did he served he served his disciples we show love for one another by serving one another Another. And I asked this question a few weeks ago, and I'm going to ask again today Who do you serve? If this is your family, and serving one another is not an option for the Christian, who are you serving in the household of faith? Now, sometimes I'll tell you, man, God doesn't need your help. And he doesn't need your help. He can do what he wants to do. But I want to tell you, there are some areas where we need you to serve. Don't ever walk in here with this idea, they got it. They have it covered. They don't need me. Don't buy to that lie from the enemy. Don't do that. You have a gift from God. And it is meant and given to you for the purpose of edifying this church and serving the one another. Because when we do that, we are showing 
God himself, that we are in fact born again. We serve because we love the one another's. Practical ways to do that. Man, maybe it's to take a single mom and give her a gift card to a salon. She hadn't had a day by herself in weeks. And you see that. You, you, you sacrifice your own day at the salon and you give it to her instead. You see a young couple and they've just been, man, flooded with kids and they hadn't been on a date in six months. And you say, you need to date your wife. Here's a gift card. Go take her to dinner. I watch the kids. That is loving one another. Loving one another is parking in the far parking lot and not the front row spot that you love every single week. These are really just practical ways to deny yourself and put other people. Maybe, maybe serving is, is, a, is something you do at home. Serving your spouse, serving your home. Hospitality is one of the weapons that God uses to push back hostility in the world today. So there's a lot of ways that you can do this in practical ways. But let me, let me end this kind of portion by saying this to you. Christ loves sinners. We ought to love sinners. Christ loves the marginalized, the oppressed, and the weak. We ought to love the marginalized, the oppressed, and the weak. Christ loves black. We ought to love black. Christ loves white. We ought to love white. Christ loves Democrats and Republicans. We ought to love Democrats and Republicans. Christ loves those who wear masks and loves those who do not wear masks. And we ought to love both as well. We do not get to pick sides on who we love. If Christ loved them, then we must and ought to love them just like Christ does. We do not get to pick a side. And when we meet this hostile world that we live in, Christian love is this conquering weapon that wins people. Now, here's what I mean by that. It's this idea in verse 12. I want to show it to you here. It's this idea that love, when we love one another, that it is a witness to a loveless world. Now, where I got that from, as I said, is in verse 12. Seemingly out of the blue, John says, no one's ever seen God. Like, why did he put it right there? Here's why he put it there. What he's communicating is the idea that no one's ever seen God. Yes, we got glimpses of God in the Old Testament through theophanies and appearances of God, but they didn't stay. And then, yes, we got an appearance of God in Jesus Christ, fully in the flesh, but now Jesus Christ has gone back to be the Father. So how is an invisible God made visible in the world today? John is saying the invisible God is made visible when people see Christians loving one another. That when we love each other here well, that we're actually putting an invisible God on display. Because people out in the world they will not read their Bible, but they will read you and they will read me. And if they can see the love of Christ that I have for my brother and sister, what a powerful, powerful conquering weapon in the world to win souls with. John Stott says it like this. Love originated in God, manifested in his son, close this up with a question. Do you love the brothers and the sisters in the household of faith? Do you love church people? Because John's point is if you do, you are a verified believer. Now, once again, I didn't say, John said, do you go to church with people? That's easy to do that. That's behavior modification. Do you love the people of God? Is your love growing for people here? Like, does your heart flutter when you see the people you come in here on Sunday? You're like, oh, yes, my people. If that is you in the posture of your heart, 
You have been born again of God. But if you do not love the brothers and the sisters in Christ, if you only come to a building once a week and there is no fluttering, no affection, no growing desire to love the people more, then you are not born of God yet. All right? So I leave you with that because my hope is, is that you would. My hope is that you would understand and receive the love of God. Because if you don't receive the love of God, you cannot love the brother in Christ. So I'm going to leave you with an invitation here. Again, we do this every single week. We, we want to give people an opportunity to, to deny themselves, to admit that everything that they do in their life will never be enough to earn the favor and the merit of God's love. You cannot work your way to achieving the love of God ever, ever, ever. But if you trust and you believe that God is love and God's manifestation of his love was sending his one and only son to die for you. And if you put your trust in Christ alone, you are loved by God. If you today are unsure, unsettled, questions, maybe this whole series has been stirring something up in you and you're kind of like, really quickly because I don't like this. Listen, if that's you, run. Don't run away. Run to me and you will receive the love of God. Come talk to us outside on the way out. We'd love to, to have a conversation with you this week. Okay. Now, the way we're going to end our time together today is I want a couple of moments here to sit and pray. And here's, I'm going to give you some roadmaps on the way to prayer. If you, uh, when I read this passage, when I read 7 through 21, when I get done, I do not say, nailed it. I mean, I just don't do that. I don't know about you. I hope you don't say that. Yes, I love a whole different thing. So what do I do in my own posture when I know I'm not nailing it? Well, what I do, and I hope what you do, too, to God. You don't hide that. You don't put on, a, I'm, I'm not that bad kind of person. I don't run away. I, I'm okay. I, no, I say, oh, I'm a horrible lover. of This is you run to the inventor the origin of love. And you ask him to increase the love for his people. You just ask the one who invented it. God, I'm not a good lover. I don't love people well. It's very hard. It's very challenging. God, the God of love, would you increase the love for you and me? And would you give it to other people? Would you give that to me? That's, that's what you pray for. That's what a Christian prays for when they read a passage like this. So I want to give you a couple of moments to do that. And then Brad is going to uh, finish out here with just a song and worship to that. So there's a space to do that. I love you guys. I'll see you soon.